Sunday, we'll have lunch together after the morning service, and there will be no p.m. service next Sunday. Verse 20 for 1 Corinthians 6, the text I just read. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. That body that houses your soul that you're in right now. Your body. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, what a command. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And his motive that he brings for us to do that is found in the first part of this verse, for you are bought with a price. That's enough. No other reason is needed. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now that price that you were bought with was his precious blood. You are bought by him. This was his purpose. This was his reason for coming into this world. You were bought with this precious price, his own precious blood. That's what you cost him, you personally. Therefore, glorify God in your body. I think of what Paul said to the Romans in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies. Same body he's speaking of here. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Anything else is unreasonable. He bought you. He redeemed you. He paid the ransom for you to be his bride. his companion, his brother, his friend. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Now, this thought begins in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul says, all things are lawful unto me. I can eat pork. I can play ball on what is called the Sabbath day. I can eat meat sacrificed to idols. Eat sacrificed to a pagan idol. There's no sin in that for me to eat that mean all things are lawful to me. You see, sin is not in things. All things are lawful to me. I think of what uh, Paul said uh, to the Colossians. Why do you live according to man-made rules? Touch not, taste not, and handle not. Which all are to perish with the using. All things are lawful to me. I'm not, all things. But all things are not expedient. All things are not necessary. 
all things are not important. He repeats himself, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, while all things are lawful, I'm not going to be brought under the power and control of any of these things. May God give us the grace not to be brought under the power and control of anything. You see, addiction, there's nothing wrong with alcohol. Uh, There's something wrong with the abuse of it. There's nothing wrong with eating. There's something wrong with the abuse of it. And Paul says, I will not be brought under the power of any of these things. And when I hear that, my cry is, Lord, don't let me be brought under the power of anything. I love David's prayer, let no iniquity have dominion over me. Order my steps in your word. That's our prayer, isn't it? Now, in the context... We're going to see why he says this. He has a very uh, important reason for saying this. But he says, meats for the belly, verse 13, and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. That belly that you're putting your food into, it's going to be gone. That food you're eating, it's going to be destroyed. It's nothing more than that. Now look what he says next. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Now the flawed logic was, the body needs food, so we give it food. Sexual desire is natural. Everybody has it, so we feed our body. You see, in that church, they, had, they grew up in Corinth. Corinth was a city of great immorality, and there was a Part of the worship service, there were a thousand prostitutes in that city used to aid them in their worship. And involved in that was sexual sin. And this is who he's talking to. And many people in the church of Corinth were saying, this is what we've grown up with, sexual sin. Is there anything wrong with it? I mean, you you feed your body. uh, You want something to eat. There's nothing wrong with eating. And if this is a natural desire, what's wrong with it? And that's what Paul is saying here. He says, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up us, up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. Now, Christ was raised in the resurrection, and we know why he was raised. I love, here's one of my favorite scriptures. He was delivered for our offenses. Why did Christ die? He was delivered for our offenses. And he was raised again for our justification. When he was raised, every believer was raised in him and justified in him. Isn't that glorious? Right now I stand before God having never sinned. That's what justification means. It doesn't mean God knows I have sinned, but uh, he treats me as if I'm not. No, in Christ, I've never sinned. He was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification, and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Talking about that final resurrection. Don't you look forward to, to being raised incorruptible? being raised perfectly conformed to the image of Christ, no longer having to deal with this thing of sin. I love that uh, song, you, the first song that you sang this morning, Waiting for My Body That Will Never Sin. And that's what we're waiting on. We earnestly long for that. And then he says in verse 15, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Now here we have one of the great mysteries of the gospel. The church is the body of Christ. Metaphorically, literally. The church is the body of Christ. 
Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 says the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That's what the church is. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Every believer is a member of the body of Christ. A hand, an ear, a foot, little finger, little toe, whatever it is, every believer really is. Here's your significance. Somebody says, oh, my life is so mundane and insignificant. No, it's not. No, if you're a believer, you're a part of the body of Christ. What significance there is in that? How important you are to the Lord. You're, you're a part of his body. I tell you what, every part of me is important to me. Well, it's just a little finger. I don't care if I lost it. No, no, that's my little finger. I, it's, it's precious to me. And that's the way every believer is to Christ, a member of his body. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Now, look what he's saying. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? Shall I take a member of Christ's body and join it to a harlot? That's what was going on. And he's showing the monstrosity of that. You know, somebody says, well, all sin's the same. Well, yeah, I see that in a sense, but it also says here, flee fornication. All other sins are done without the body. Fornication is done with your body. And that's taking the body of Christ, a member of Christ, and using it in that fashion. Now, notice what he says, verse 15. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for the two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Now, Paul is quoting uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, where it's talked about the man and the woman, the two becoming one flesh. And Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 that that intimate act in marriage is a picture of the union and the mystery of Christ and his church. That's why this is so important. This is why it's, it's oh, may the Lord give us grace to glorify him in our bodies. Your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I take that which is joined, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that's joined unto the Lord, united to him, is what that's talking about. United to him. You know, we, we're joined to him like the man and the woman. The two shall be one flesh. The, bright, the vine and the branches, the same stem going through the uh, vine goes through the branches. But he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. One spirit. One spirit with him. Verse 18. Now he says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Now here's another great mystery. He had already said your body, your, your body is the body of Christ. And now he says your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. God the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, because that's the case, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? You're not your own. Boy, don't you know that, son? You're not your own. That's a blessed place to be, isn't it? You're not your own. For you are bought with a Christ. Now, this is the greatest of all arguments to glorify God in your body and in your spirit, that spirit that he gave you in the new birth. Now, somebody says or thinks, and I bet somebody's thinking this because I thought of it. If my body is nothing but sin, 
if my flesh is nothing but sin, how in the world am I going to go about glorifying God in my body? That's a tall order. Why do you give that command to glorify God in your body if your body is nothing but sin in and of itself? Because it is. It is. The carnal mind is enmity against God. I wouldn't dare say that it's not, but here is the difference. He gave us a spirit in the new birth, and greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. It's the only reason. He's given you his spirit. But if our old nature is still, de still depraved, how is that possible? With God, all things are possible. If he said glorify God in your body, glorify God in your body, I pray that the Lord would enable me to glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are God's, which belong to him. And the reason I'm called upon to do that and you're called upon to do that because it's because he bought you. He bought you with a price. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You're not your own. You're bought with a price, and that price was the precious blood of Christ. Now, I want to spend the rest of our time thinking about this. You're bought with a price. When the Lord was in the Garden of Gethsemane. I don't know whether this was a vision that only he saw, but he saw a cup brought before him. You remember when he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me? Now, what was in that cup? I know what was in that cup the sins of his people. And when he saw that cup, because he understands sin, me and you don't really understand it. I know I don't. When I'm talking about things, I know I'm, the stuff I'm talking about right now, I know it's so far above me, high, and, and, and uh, oh, it's, 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 and you feel the same way, I'm, I'm sure. You think this is, this is way over, out of, over my head. I, yeah, it is. It is. But we don't much understand sin, but he, he's the only one who does. And when he saw that cup, the scripture says, he being in agony, sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Blood started coming out of his pores as he thought about drinking the contents of that cup. That is the price he had to pay. When he drank that cup, that's because that's when he was made sin. What all that means, I don't know. But the scripture says he bare our sins in his own body on the tree. My sins he bore in his own body on the tree. And he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And that's because he is in his flesh was overwhelmed at the thought of being made sin because he knew what that meant. I don't. You don't. None of us feel near bad about our sins. We ought to. You know that. We don't see. We're so weighed down with the flesh, but he did. But if he didn't drink that cup, salvation for me and you would not, would not be possible. Nevertheless, he said, not my will, but thine be done. He drank the cup of our sins. He bare our sins in his own body on the tree, and he put them away. He put them away. They're all taken away. That's what he did on Calvary's tree. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. He made the way through that glorious work. 
He made the way for God to be just and justify somebody like me or you. Now, let me remind you once again, I've already said something once, justification is not God looking at me and knowing I'm bad, but saying I'm not gonna, I'm gonna count him good anyway because of what my son did. No justification is I stand before God having never sinned. That's what Christ's justifying work is. That's, that's our boldness on judgment day. I, I've never sinned. In Christ, I've kept God's law perfectly. I'm perfectly righteous. I'm perfectly holy. That is what Christ accomplished by his death. Now, I need to bring this out. How offensive is that message? that says Jesus Christ can die for your sins and you wind up in hell anyway if you don't do your part to make what he did work. That is utterly offensive. Somebody that preaches something like that is a false prophet that does not know God and does not know the gospel. You see, the death of Christ is successful. He perfected forever them that are sanctified. You were bought with a price. Now you think of what your salvation costs the Father. I thought about what it costs the Son. He gave Himself. Listen to this scripture. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says, He that spared not his own son. That's what it costs the Father. Yes, salvation's free to us, but it wasn't free to God. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not? Freely. Don't miss that word freely. Freely. Give us all things. What could possibly prevent him from freely giving us everything that pertains to salvation? Because everything he does is for Christ's sake. You know why he justifies me? Because Christ died. You know why he sanctifies me? Because Christ died. You know why he elected me? Because Christ died. You know why he regenerates me? Because Christ died. You know why I'm redeemed? Because Christ died. The death of Christ is everything in salvation. You were bought with this price. Why will I be in heaven? Because Christ died. Why am I persevering right now? Because Christ died. Why do I have faith? Because Christ died. Why do I have repentance? Because Christ died. Why do I love God? Because Christ died. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You were bought with a price for Christ to save me and you, to make us his bride, his spouse, his friend, his lover, his companion, his brother. Ephesians 5, 26 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it. And cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. The believer is the father's gift to the son. But he had to pay for this gift. I don't understand that. But what a gift. The father giving Christ his bride. And Christ had to pay to have this gift. Let me quote these scriptures. Um, Acts 20, 28. Feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ. Galatians 3, 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law 
being made a curse for us. Romans 3, 24, uh, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption, the redeeming blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 9, 22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. <clears throat> you belong to somebody else. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Isn't it wonderful to not be your own? You belong to him. You're his property. I like being his property. I like him buying me, being my Lord, my master. Never was there ever such a good master and a poor servant as me. You're bought with a price. When this passing world is done, when has sunk yon glaring sun, when I stand with Christ in glory, looking o'er life's finished story, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. When I hear the wicked call, on the rocks and hills to fall. When I see them start and shrink on the fiery deluge brink, then, Lord, shall I fully know. Not till then how much I owe. When I stand before thy throne, dressed in beauty, not my own. When I see thee as thou art, love thee with unsinning heart, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Chosen not for good in me, wakened up from wrath to flee, hidden in the Savior's side, by his Spirit, sanctified. Teach me, Lord, on earth to show by my love how much I owe. When the praise of heaven I hear, loud as thunder to the ear, loud as many waters noise, sweet as harps melodious voice, then, Lord, then, Lord, shall I fully know. Not to them how much I owe. You are bought with a price. Let's pray. Lord, we stand amazed and all we can do is bow down and worship that you would give your son to redeem us. We stand amazed at our redeemer who so willingly drank that cup knowing what he was doing knowing he would glorify you and save all your people, yet to think that even at the thought of drinking that cup, he was in agony and sweat great drops of blood. Lord, how we thank you for your spirit who has made known to us the preciousness of the blood of thy son the price at which we bought. Now, Lord, enable us to 
because we've been bought with a price to glorify you in our body and in our spirit. Forgive us of our sins. Oh, Lord, forgive us our sins. We're so very sinful. We're so filled with iniquity and sin. Forgive us, and may we be found in Christ. Bless this message for your glory and for our good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.